Hello everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Daily Grey Refuel, where I recap the latest news in the Ethereum ecosystem. I'm your host, Anthony Sassano, and today's the 26th of March, 2021. All right, let's get into it, everyone. So just before we do that, actually, I just wanted to give a huge congratulations to Gitcoin on another successful Gitcoin grants matching round. This is this was the biggest one yet. And of course, a big thank you to everyone who donated to me at the Daily Gway and also to Ethub's Gitcoin grant. Hope you all got your donations in in time. Um, you know, it was, as I said, it was a big round, right? Uh, you can see here uh, a Waki from, from Gitcoin, Gitcoin's founder, basically put out this kind of uh, chart with some stats here. Uh, in, in round eight, 1.1 million was raised. In round nine, 1.9 million. So another 800,000 on top of that. Obviously kind of like smashing the record there. Uh, and you can see, you know, we, we've been kind of like, I guess that the earlier rounds started off quite quite small. You know, round one at 42K, round two, 156K, round 396K. But you know, there was there was growth there, right? Um, and some of these happened during a bear market too. Uh, I think one, two, and three happened during 2019 from memory. Um, so yeah, it's good to keep that in mind as well. But yeah, since then, it's just ex exploded up. And particularly the last three rounds of where it's, where it's been really big, right? Like 763,000 for round seven, 1.1 million uh, for uh, round eight, 1.9 million for round nine. So really awesome to see this. And there's also, you know, much more people contributing now as well, I think, uh, which is which is very positive too. So yeah, um, thanks to everyone for, for donating to, to myself and, and all the other grants out there. Uh, and Awoki also put out a uh, tweet here basically saying that 82% of the grounds round nine contributions were done via layer two, which is ZK Sync. So you probably would have used ZK Sync if you were donating because it's much cheaper to do that than, uh, you know, donate uh, on layer one Ethereum, of course. So that's a that's a pretty, you know, hefty number, 82% uh, doing it on layer two, which is, which is awesome. I mean, it just shows that this technology kind of works, you know, people are willing to use it once it's, um, you know, rather seamless. I think, you know, it can be more, more seamless than what it is. There's still a few kind of like steps that you have to go through. But once you've kind of like set up your wallet and everything and funded it, it, it it's very seamless. So, uh, but I think it'll get better with time. And, you know, I'm looking forward to a big round 10 as well here. So the, I guess the biggest news from the last 24 hours, and as I was talking about yesterday, I thought this was going to happen. Um, but I guess like the TLDR here is that the Optimism public mainnet has been delayed until July of this year. Now, obviously we were all expecting this to go live in March, uh, which obviously I, I mentioned on the refuel, I think a couple of times now where I thought that it was going to be delayed because we hadn't heard anything for a little while. And also um, uh, Uniswap launching in May kind of like was... The, kind of for me was just like, okay, well, they're very close to the Optimism team and they'll probably want to go on layer two as well. Uh, it's probably not not ready yet. So July is, is I like, I mean, that's like what, three months away. That's an eternity in crypto, right? But again, I mean, I wrote about this in the Daily Grain newsletter, so I, I won't I won't kind of like go too deep into my thoughts here, but I did want to kind of give the thoughts for, for those just viewing and listening. Basically, this is probably the, one of the hardest decisions a team ever has to make is whether to go to mainnet with a product that they don't feel is ready to go to mainnet with, that they don't feel is something that they'd be proud shipping, right? Or delaying it by three months and dealing with the kind of short-term fallout from that. Because obviously Optimism, you know, their, their kind of layer two solution has been hyped to no end, right? Everyone's hyping it up, you know, it's going to, it's going to save Ethereum, blah, blah, blah. Um, you know, I've probably played a little bit of a part in that too, but at the same time, you know, delaying it would not have been an easy decision here. And they would have only have done it for, for critical reasons. And they explained some of their reasons in the post saying they want to make sure their partners are, are you know, up to speed on it. Their, their, their bridges that they're going to be able to bridge in are, are working, you know, that are all the wallets and everything are like compatible. So basically they want to make sure the user experience is as good as possible before before going live here, which I totally get, right? Uh, I know, I, I understand people's frustrations and disappointments here. But at the same time, this is bleeding edge technology. This is stuff that's never been done before. This is stuff that he's dealing with real money. So I'd rather like the teams move slower and, um, you know, and make sure everything's okay uh, and, you know, safe for people to use rather than rush to mainnet just for the sake of it. Now, in, in saying that, it's not like Optimism isn't doing anything now. I mean, they have a public, uh, sorry, a private mainnet, I guess you could call it. That's live right now. It has been live for a little bit and Synthetix has been using it. Uh, I'm sure there's other teams building on it in stealth right now, but the way the private main networks, I guess you could call it, is that it's basically a whitelist process. So unless you are whitelisted by the team, you you can't deploy any smart contracts to their network. Um, and it's completely centralized. The team obviously has complete control over it. They can reverse kind of transactions if they wanted to, they could pause it, they could shut down the system and, and you know, there wouldn't be much you could do about it. So from that perspective, uh, 
it's not the dream, right? It's not what we want. Like we want basically a, a public permissionless kind of layer two system that anyone can build on. Uh, but that doesn't mean no one can build on it right now. And in the post, Optimism also mentioned that they have, uh, uh, you know, a do- about a dozen projects going live uh, on their technology lined up so far. So if you consider that those dozen projects are already working on getting the implementations going, um, they're obviously going to be whitelisted. We can say that two of those are Synthetics and Uniswap. I, I still think, you know, Uniswap's going to go live on Optimism in May, uh, you know, and, and that'll be like a nice experience for people to, to kind of like get them, uh, uh, I guess, like using the technology before it goes live to, a, you know, in a public fashion in July. Um, but yeah, just a, a bit of disappointing news, a bit of sobering news, but at the same time, I think it's, it's, it's going to be okay in the long term. And, you know, on the same note, I guess, you know, if you look at the rest of the layer two ecosystem, we have a lot of things live right now, you know, loop ring, of course, I talk about a lot, ZK sync. I spoke about Arbitrum's mainnet candidate being on, on the Covan test net. Um, I'm expecting them to go live in April with on mainnet with a fully public mainnet that anyone can build upon. Uh, and that's just, you know, competition that Optimism has to deal with. And they've kind of like ceded some ground to now because as I said, three months in this space is an eternity. So they, and they would know this as well, the team, they would realize that delaying by three months is they're going to lose some market share because of this. Um, you know, they're obviously going to lose a little bit of community favor, but they're doing what's best, f- uh, what they believe is best. And I, I can't fault them for that, of course. So We'll, we'll, we'll see what happens. I mean, I know Immutable X is also going to go live soon. They've been teasing it for, for a while now, any day now. We bring Diversify already live, ZK Sync already live. A lot of you have used it, uh, you know, but at the end of the day, we can say that it's already live and everything like that. But unless it offers like a very similar experience to layer one, then most people aren't going to kind of like use it or care about it. Now, Loop Ring's great and everything, but of course, um, you know, their, their DEX isn't anywhere near as liquid as Uniswap is, for example. And, they, you know, it's becoming more liquid over time. Uh, same with Diversify, but it's not there yet. It's like we're rebuilding DeFi, essentially, um, you know, and we're trying to like speed run it, which I think we will. But at the same time, um, you know, people were hoping Optimism would go live with a bunch of star apps like Synthetics and Uniswap and even Chainlink and stuff like that. Uh, and then, you know, there would be like a, an ecosystem on there from day one. And, you know, then, then there probably will be by the time we get to the public mainnet release, there probably will already be Synthetics and Uniswap and Chainlink and, and maybe a bunch of other apps on there so that when, you know, we go to the public mainnet, there's going to be plenty of uh, things for uh, builders to tap into when they're building on top of Optimism. So, yeah. Uh, I mean, you can go read the full post. Uh, it's a little linked in the YouTube description. Uh, but yeah, I, I personally, I wasn't surprised by the delay. I was surprised by the fact that they delayed it to July. You know, I, it, it seems like it's weird because like I know teams can get ahead of themselves, but the fact that they said March and then they had to delay it by three months means that they weren't ever going to launch in March, basically. Um, so from that perspective, I, I, I get like sometimes teams can get ahead of themselves and, and do these announcements. But if they had just not announced that they were coming in March, it would have been a lot better, right? I think uh, maybe this is a lesson to a lot of other builders out there. And this is a lesson. This, this is something that a lot of builders don't do that, you know, they don't really give dates. They don't like to give dates. You know, everyone always asks for dates and things like that. But, you know, anything can happen for a number of reasons. And, you know, by giving even a rough date and then missing that kind of target and having to delay it, you inevitably lead to disappointment. Now, you know, is it worth the disappointment of, de- of delaying something or is it worth the kind of like just not giving a date, right? And just dealing with... Um, People may be complaining about that. I think it's worth just not giving a date, right? And then giving a date when you 100% know you're going to launch um, or just launch it, right? And instead of even, you don't even need to give a date, just launch it, right? Get it out to mainnet and surprise everyone. Um, you know, I, I think that's probably the better way to do it. But anyway, I, I understand how difficult of a decision this was for that for the team. They've been working nonstop on this for quite a while now. And I think it's the future still bright for them. I think they're going to they're gonna kill it. Uh, I, we're just going to have to wait a little bit longer for that to play out, I think. So Robert Leshner posted on Twitter today, just a bit of a teaser here, that he said he had the opportunity to present DeFi and Compound to the Federal Reserve staff. And then he goes on to say, eventually the banking system will run on shared open ledgers. Each day we get closer. And he gave a bit of a teaser with a, with a few slides that he presented to the Federal Reserve here. Basically like very simple slides kind of explaining how Compound works, uh, kind of explaining how the interest rate model works on Compound and kind of like how, uh, I guess, like users can interface with banks, which can interface with DeFi protocols, which I think is interesting as well. And on this note here in this image, you know, I've said it before, but I think we're going to have a bunch of centralized services tapping into these decentralized services to offer, um, you know, certain kind of things like yield and, and, and other kind of apps. And, you know, some people might call it CE DeFi, which I think is a dumb term, but I mean, 
I guess like it, it describes what this is, you know, centralized DeFi. I mean, it doesn't really make much sense, but you know, it's just basically the concept of centralized institutions tapping into the DeFi ecosystem and offering a, uh, I guess like a solution to, to end users, right? And that's what this all this is all about at the end of the day. I think it's fine that this happens and this is inevitably, inevitably gonna happen. But the, the point is having choice here. So, you know, you obviously want to have the choice where they to go through, I mean, it's probably not even gonna be a bank, just any kind of like centralized institution, you know, that's offering you this stuff. You can go through them and you can have the peace of mind of that, right? There's probably gonna be in, built in insurance and things like that. Um, and, and that's fine for, for, for users who wanna do that. But then you're also gonna have the opportunity and the, um, I guess the option of going straight to the protocols themselves, right? Um, and and that I think is what a lot of users are going to trend towards. M you know, maybe not most of them for at least the short to medium term, because a lot of people do trust these kind of centralized institutions. But as time goes on, and the more, the, the, I guess, like the easier we make it for them to tap into DeFi protocols without, uh, you know, difficulty, I think is going to be really bullish there. But yeah, I, I hope. Leshner kind of shares the, uh, I guess, the deck, the full deck that he showed here and maybe goes into a bit more detail about what he presented and how they reacted to it as well. I mean, as as Ryan Sean Adams says here, like, so what was their reaction? I mean, I would love to know that as well. I don't think he, re he replied uh, down here, but anyway... Um, you know, on that note, uh, really cool to see this. I, uh, you know, the Federal Reserve probably was just like very cautious. They're going to move like super slowly on this sort of stuff, I think. But, you know, the fact that Leshner was already talking to them and he's obviously the founder of, you know, a big DeFi protocol in compound finance and an investor by, uh, via his robot ventures kind of fund. He, uh, he, he's probably one of the best people to kind of like, I guess, quote unquote, red pill, uh, the Federal Reserve on DeFi. So yeah, really, really cool to see this from, from Robert today. So a few upgrades came to Looperings Layer 2 Exchange today. So they have uh, basically made it 30% cheaper to add and remove liquidity on their AMM. Uh, in general, all blocks are between 10, uh, 2 to 10% cheaper due to transaction data compression. Um, so yeah, I mean, this is their Layer 2 getting um, just more efficient over time, which is really cool to see. There were some other upgrades here. They added a fee for AMM deposits, but this actually reduces the overall AMM L LP fees since pool exits are cut by greater than this amount. So essentially like just reshuffling the fees here, but making them lower. Uh, all fees on layer one and layer two are now dynamically adjusted with gas and the ETH price. And uh, the wallet is available, uh, the, the mobile wallet app is available in Spanish. So, I mean, you know, I've spoken about Looprink so much and I, I know I say this every time I speak about Looprink so much, but they just continue to silently, you know, killer and i don't think they get enough appreciation because they've been live on layer two for quite a while now and i was just talking about how you know before i was saying there's plenty of layer two solutions that are live today they just need more users they need more liquidity and that's slowly coming over time and i think loop ring is one of the, the kind of like forerunners here along with diversify which i'm going to talk about a little bit um a little bit later uh but yeah i mean if you haven't used them yet i mean i highly recommend going and just trying it right even if it's just like a test transaction maybe just like a hundred dollar swap or something like that just to see how cheap it is and how fast it is um and like getting back to i guess that feeling of you know, when Ethereum mainnet or layer one, when the fees were like, I guess, you know, one GUI or something like that. So yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I use Loopring wherever, whenever I can. It, it is definitely a very, very smooth experience. They've done a really good job, um, you know, and they're always improving it. So kudos to them for this. Speaking of gas fees, uh, one of my favorite websites, and I, I use their Chrome extension, you can see in the top right, is gasnow.org. Now, this website, uh, you, a lot of you would have used, it basically forecasts uh, gas prices, so it tells you rapid, fast, standard, or slow, and it updates in real time, because what the uh, GasNow website does is it actually looks into the Ethereum mempool to see what the uh, real-time transaction cost is. Now, what they've added here um, in you know the bottom of this picture here, they've added estimated costs and trans uh, of transfers and interactions for popular kind of things. So an ETH transfer, of course, is, is listed there. An ERC-20 transfer, such as USDT, DAI transfer, or an NFT transfer. And then on the right-hand side, they have like what a Uniswap trade is going to cost you. Um, one of Uniswap uh, adding liquidity is going to cost you, removing liquidity is going to cost, and then uh, Compound and, and OpenSea. So this is, I mean, really cool for a reference kind of thing. Like if you want to kind of see, okay, you know, gas fees might be low right now. It's maybe a hundred. What's my, uh, I guess like Uniswap trade going to cost me right now? And, and right now, I mean, at time of this screenshot, I guess, which is which is relevant to right now, uh, it would cost $22 to do it in a rapid fashion. So basically to get it into the same block um, or about $21.70 to get it within one minute. So this is really cool, really important here. Uh, I think Gas now, I mean, they're doing great, great work with this. It's my favorite kind of, uh, I guess, like 
gas website to look at to, to estimate prices. I mean, it works pretty well. Like whenever I need a rapid transaction done, I always reference their rapid uh, kind of amount here. I set it and then it, and, it, and then it basically works. Uh, so yeah, great, great little feature that they've added here. So the Rainbow Mobile Wallet app has added a new kind of uh, section called Discover. So basically what this allows you to do, it allows you to explore all the best opportunities across DeFi. So you can see here in the picture, they've got like a top movers section at the top here. Uh, they've got like a, you know, a little banner here with the DeFi Pulse Index, which is really cool to see. So you can quickly tap in and buy it. Uh, different lists um, and you can add like favorites and a, and a watch and a watch list here uh, or what's trending. Uh, then you scroll down, you can kind of like add and remove liquidity to like Uniswap pool and things like that. Uh, so yeah, pretty big upgrade here, pretty big feature uh, thing here. If you haven't kind of checked out Rainbow yet, it's a, it's a mobile wallet app. I, I highly recommend going and checking it out. I think I've spoken about it before, but it's really cool. It's one of the most beautiful, if not the most most beautiful Ethereum mobile wallets I've I've used. I mean, Argent is, is definitely up there too. Um, but, you know, I, I think this is just really great. And Rainbow, uh, you know, is, is definitely Ethereum native, like the founder and the, and the team is very, very deep in, into the Ethereum ecosystem. And I, I spoke, I, yeah, I spoke about yesterday on the refill, how they're going to be supporting layer two, specifically Optimism, like out of the gate. Now, you know, I think the wallet space is pretty crowded in general. There's a lot of mobile wallets, but... I think what Rainbow is doing is they're taking the approach to becoming like the best Ethereum mobile wallet app, right? And having like everything you want in there from DeFi to NFTs to Layer 2, all the good stuff. So yeah, if you're interested in trying out a new wallet, especially on, on mobile, definitely go give Rainbow a, a look here. So CL on Twitter put out a really great tweet uh, today basically saying, uh, he, he basically says, why isn't anyone talking about how NFTs being settled in ETH means ETH is now potentially the base currency of all internet culture, history, memes, and digital art? I mean, I think I've spoken about this before and I, I kind of replied saying I had tweeted something similar to this. Um, you know, this is something that a lot of people seem to be underappreciating. The NFT economy is priced in ETH, right? That's a, that's a big part of it. But also, if you look at a lot of the NFTs, they pay homage to ETH. Like if you look at the art pieces, there's, there's, you know, a lot of them have like an ETH logo in them somewhere, right? Or like the videos, they have an ETH logo. Uh, a lot of the NFT like collectibles have, have something to do with ETH. Um, so it's becoming like a, a cult, uh, like a, I guess like a cultural symbol within the NFT space because a lot of these NFTs are on Ethereum. Uh, and, you know, that's basically kind of like saying, and, and I guess like coupled with the fact that ETH is being used as the currency or the money of this ecosystem, it's basically cementing ETH as this, is, is this kind of beautiful base currency of, uh, of this kind of like, as CL says, this internet culture, history, memes, digital art, all this good stuff here. Very, very, very important, I think, for like the narratives around ETH as an asset. I mean, you can see here that F Fiskant has basically said, ETH is art money is better than ETH as ultrasound money. And it's funny because I, I like the ETH is ultrasound money meme. I think it's fine. But I think, you know, every time the, the Ethereum ecosystem comes up with like a new meme, for some reason, people think it's cringe. And I, I, I kind of often joke that I say like, the actual good meme that Ethereum has is the fact that our, our memes are cringe. Now... You know, take that as you as you will. But in general, I do think that this makes a lot of sense and this resonates with a lot of people because if someone hears ultrasound money, they're gonna have no idea what that means, right? Um, that's like a very insider meme. But if you tell someone that like, you know, ETH is like, um, you know, the, the the NFT economy runs on Ethereum, right? It's, it, you know, ETH is, is used to buy and sell these sorts of stuff. That's a lot easier to digest because you can make like a, I guess a comparison to video games and say, okay, well, you know, if you're playing World of Warcraft, what is the economy there? Well, I mean, it's gold, right? You have gold, silver, and copper, and then there's a whole economy built up around that as currency. Uh, and then, you know, someone asks, okay, well, you know, the Ethereum, there's an economy on there. There's like NFTs. Okay. Well, what do I use? And it's like, well, I mean, technically you could use anything, right? You can use stable coins. You can use other tokens, but you know, what most, most people use is ETH. And that's because it's the most widely held token, most widely, widely liquid, you know, big, largest market cap, uh, we're most well known and just easiest to kind of accept here. So I think this bundles together a bunch of the different memes that we've kind of, I guess, tried to make happen over the years, like ETH is money. And I think ETH is ultrasound money falls into that. Um, ETH is like a base currency for this new economy on Ethereum. And I think CL just put it really, really, really well here. And I mean, you can see the popularity of his tweet. A lot of people seem to agree with this as well. So yeah, I mean, it makes sense. And, and it's, I think it's just overall bullish for ETH in general too. 
So EPNS announced that they had raised, uh, I guess, like a, a, an extended seed round here, uh, an additional 666,000 from a bunch of different investors. Now, for those who don't know, EPNS is, it stands for Ethereum Push Notification Service. They're basically building a decentralized uh, notification service for Ethereum. Uh, disclosure here, I am a seed investor in EPNS here. Uh, they're a great team. I mean, I, I spoke to them really early on. They're a really, really passionate team out of, out of India, uh, working on something that I think is actually uh, needed in the ecosystem, right? I mean, we all have like notifications that come from, I guess, MetaMask where our, our, our transaction is confirmed, but MetaMask isn't giving you confirmations about um, certain things. Like it's not gonna tell you when you receive tokens in your wallet. It's not gonna tell you when your CDP is at risk. I know there's some solutions that already do that, but I think we need a standard for it. And, and APNS is, is building this standard. Um, and I think we need one that's decentralized as well. So obviously APNS is gonna have a token and they're gonna try and decentralize this whole kind of ecosystem out here. Um, I think they're going live rather soon, but basically congrats to them on, on this raise. It's going to give them a bit more kind of runway here. And they brought on a bunch of different, like, I guess, uh, VCs and, and investors here. And you can kind of read this in the, I guess, YouTube description below. But yeah, really great to see this here. Um, and, and I can't wait to see them kind of, I guess, uh, keep pushing forward here. Uh, keep, you know, once they get the token out, I'm sure they're going to get a lot more uh, you know, attention because that's what happens when you launch a token, right? People pay a lot more attention to your project. But if you haven't been paying attention to them yet, I definitely go recommend checking them out. They already have a mobile wallet as well. You can check out too. Uh, so, and you know, you can set up some alerts and things like that. So, you know, the product is definitely live, but I think they're going to kick it into high gear over the, over the coming months. So speaking of tokens, uh, Diversify have announced that they've in, uh, they're introducing their new token called the DVF token. Now, for those who don't know, I guess like the Diversify ecosystem has a token already called Nectar or Neck, uh, but this was like a token that came over from um, ETH, ETH for Nex, uh, before they were known as Diversify. So it kind of had a bit of baggage there, I think. Um, and so they're doing kind of like a token swap from, from what I can see here, uh, based on a snapshot, um, uh, 70, 7% of the DVF supply will be distributed as an airdrop to, to neck holders, you know, um, and then, you know, they're basically going to be using this as part of the, uh, the diversify platform here. So they go through their kind of like, I guess, logic here uh, and why they're doing this and stuff like that and, and what the distribution looks like essentially here. So, you know, neck holders get 7%, uh, Usage airdrop, so retro plus future is up to 8%. Strategic supporters got 10 to 15%. Liquidity Labs, uh, the company that created Diversify, aka team, gets 25%. And liquidity mining future community distributions get up to 60% here. Uh, so I guess strategic supporters are the investors, and I, I'm, I really like this. 10 to 15 percent to investors is, is, I think, on the lower end, which is which is great. Uh, 25 percent to the team. I mean, you know, pretty standard thing. So if you take 15 percent and 25 percent, that's a 40 percent split uh, for for team, 60 percent for for community here, which is, you know, I mean, obviously it's not like the 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 you know the 90 10 split you see some some projects do but at the end of the day you know there's some there's a lot of ways to do token splits here and i think you know just getting tokens into the hands of as many people as possible is, is cool you know these strategic supporters can be a, a number of people as well it doesn't just have to be like the evil vcs right or the evil funds it can be you know people in the ecosystem that have, have, have participated in these rounds that can actually add a lot of value i mean personally i've participated in a few strategic rounds um and there's lots of people in them it's not just like five people right there's there's like um you know sometimes hundreds of people in these rounds that are like key ecosystem people that you want on board and you know from that perspective i think that's really really great here and you know they're dropping seven percent to neck holders as well which is really really cool and i mean just a caveat here they do say this is not not final uh but this kind of just gives you a basic estimation here on on that so yeah definitely go check this out if you want more details about what they're doing here with the dvf token so <laughs> It's funny, I you know, I, I mean, I was speaking about kind of like layer two just before and about how there's like lots of hype behind it. I think one of the most hyped layer twos right now is Immutable X because they've been hyping it on Twitter for like, I mean, pretty much this whole month. They've just been going really hard about it. So at this point, I mean, I'm expecting it to launch like any day now, you know, possibly, you, I mean, definitely in April, but like I, I, maybe it could be in March, I don't know, but I'm expecting them to launch e e any day now. And for those who don't know, just a refresher here, Immutable X is going to be a decentralized exchange focused on NFTs at layer two. They're going to be using Starkware. Uh, they're going to have instant trade confirmation, 9,000 plus transactions per second and zero gas fees. Uh, obviously, as a layer two, they inherit Ethereum's security and decentralization, which is extremely bullish. And I spoke about the other day how Starkware demoed that they were able to mint 600,000 NFTs at a cost of 10 gas per NFT on layer two, which effectively is a 33,000 time cheaper 
uh, minting of NFTs than it, what it is on Ethereum mainnet. So yeah, this is incredibly bullish. I mean, you know, even though we have to wait till July for an open public kind of uh, optimism, there's still a lot to be optimistic about, right? There's uh, Immutable X, I mean, I mentioned before, Arbitrum and ZK Sync and, and uh, Loop Bring and Diversify, all, all that good stuff. Uh, and, you know, if you're not using them today, I suggest definitely going and just checking them out, as I said before. I think that, you know, you can probably feel, oh, Layer 2 is not here because, you know, I, optimism is not here. I just don't think that's very accurate. And I think that you should definitely... Um, uh, try out uh, you know all the all the ones you can and and kind of like don't leave it uh, especially when gas is cheaper on layer one because the I, I mean unfortunately you have to spend gas fees on layer one to get funds onto layer two I think eventually that'll be ironed out with like you know batched onboarding from layer one you know uh, fiat onboarding and centralized exchange onboarding and things like that but you know we're all pioneers here I mean I've said it before like the fact that we're pioneers means that you're gonna have to just like I guess you know, it's it's a bit, little bit, maybe a little bit crappy to say, but you, you, we all have to kind of deal with this for now, right? Um, and you know, the the kind of opportunities come with this, and you know, I guess like the the yield being high comes with the fact that not many people know about this. It comes with the fact that a lot of people actually priced out of this. Um, you know, the, the fact that you can buy tokens really early because not a, not a lot of people know about it is is really promising too. So I guess when you really think about it. The high gas fees are basically just like the price of alpha in this ecosystem, the price of the high yields, the price of, um, you know, the the, uh, the the token prices, you know, being just being early in general to tokens and things like that. Um, and that's not to say like it's a good thing necessarily um, and that like I think that people should be paying $100, you know, fees um, just to do like a couple of Uniswap trades. Not at all. But I think, you know, in the meantime, you know, there's, there's already solutions you can use. And, and of course, there are like other kind of like chains uh, that you can use as well. Like the Matic POS chain is, is very popular. XDAI is very popular. Um, you know, and there's, and there's other layer one blockchains that have, you know, some kind of like, uh, you know, things that you can do on there, like yield farming and stuff like that. So that's all going to happen. And, you know, I've kind of warmed up to the idea over the last few months of like the quote, quote unquote multi-chain kind of... Um, ecosystem playing out. I do believe the majority of the, I guess, net, network activity is going to remain on Ethereum in, on both layer one and layer two, but there's no denying that these other kind of networks, uh, layer one networks are going to find their own niche. They're going to find, you know, what, what they're going to basically be good at and what they're going to, you know, offer users that Ethereum can't, and they're going to lean into it, which is, which is fine. Uh, you know, a perfect example of this is the utility uh, chains like Filecoin and Arweave that are doing decentralized file storage. I think they're super interesting, right? I think they're really, really great. I think they add a ton of value to Ethereum specifically because Ethereum, uh, you know, with layer two is data hungry. So if layer twos can tap into uh, these other kind of like places for for, for data that um, maybe cannot be stored on, on, on Ethereum layer one, data such as, uh, I guess, the um the nft kind of like images and things like that because it's too expensive to store it on layer one ethereum then you know that that's even more positive so yeah definitely i mean people call me an eth maximalist sometimes i mean i don't think so i mean i've, I've gone through why i don't think i am before and you know if i was i would think everything else is a scam but ethereum i, I think very few things are actual scams in this ecosystem i do think that there are just a lot of ill thought out projects and, and projects that are kind of pointless but at the end of the day the market will decide, you know, users will decide what they want to use. And, you know, maybe a lot of these other projects act as like a, a, a way to kind of like, um, you know, breed this competition between, you know, Ethereum, the other chains, uh, you know, and, and layer two and things like that. So yeah, I definitely think it's all positive. Um, but, you know, I'll leave it at that for now. I won't, won't go too down, too deep down that rabbit hole. I mean, I could talk for hours about what I think about the competition in, in the space right now. But again, it is a completely open question right now. I'm placing all my bets on Ethereum, of course, in the Ethereum ecosystem uh, in terms of like the time I spend and, and the capital I, de I deploy. Uh, but that's just because it's it's where I can spend most of my time and get the most kind of value out of both at the social level, at the kind of like, I guess, um, in in intellectual level and the, uh, I guess, like monetary level as well. And I think... You know, a lot of you watching, you know, especially if you're watching me do daily Ethereum recaps every day would feel the same way about this. So yeah, really, really bullish times all across the board, I think. And I can't wait for more of these layer twos to go live. All right, that's it for today, everyone. Thank you again for watching and listening. Be sure to subscribe to that channel if you haven't yet. Give the video a thumbs up, subscribe to the newsletter, join the Discord channel, and I'll catch you all next week. Thanks, everyone.